So welcome to the third and final lecture in the Introduction to Produce Safety for Undergraduate Students series. In this third lecture, we're going to be discussing some control strategies and interventions that can be applied throughout the entire produce supply chain to reduce risk of foodborne illness from consuming produce. So some key learning outcomes from this presentation. After watching today's lecture, you will be able to identify possible control strategies and interventions that can be used throughout the produce supply chain, as well as define some of their strengths and limitations. So here we're going to be defining control strategies and interventions um, as separate things. They're often used interchangeably. So we're going to be defining a control strategy as something that uh, talks about the target and the goal. So for example, if our target is irrigation water and our goal is to reduce that pathogen contamination in that irrigation water, the control strategy will be defined as reduce pathogen contamination of irrigation water. Um, and then an intervention is going to be defined as the, the specific procedure that is used to reduce that pathogen contamination. So for example, chlorine treatment of that irrigation water. And in the second key learning outcome, um, after watching today's lecture, you will be able to, in the practical world, select appropriate control strategies and interventions that can and should be used to assure produce safety under different circumstances. So take home messages. The first is that every step throughout the produce supply chain comes with unique food safety challenges. And we're gonna talk about many of those today. Um, Another one that is really important is that preventative approaches are more effective than reactive approaches at reducing food safety risks. This is a really important one because often there's this assumption um, that's focused on testing, right? So if I make my product and at the end I test it, and if my tests come back negative um, for pathogens and I have a safe product. And unfortunately, it's not necessarily that easy. Um, and we're gonna talk about that today. Another take home message is that it's important to consider all potential risk factors across the entire produce supply chain when making decisions that are targeted at minimizing food safety risks. Um, and this again is important for produce where we don't have a kill step throughout production. Um, because what that means is that practices like how you irrigate your field, for example, can and will impact the safety of your finished product. Um, and the final one is a really tough one, and it's that there is no way to achieve zero risk. So it doesn't matter if you have the best food safety plan or the best practices. Um, and so therefore, um, in jobs in the produce uh, industry, you will most likely have to define what level of risk you are willing to accept with your product. Um, and our hope is that with this lecture, um, we will give you some tools to be a bit more thoughtful in how you make some of those really tough decisions about accepting levels of risk. So this is a general overview of some of the practices throughout the produce supply chain that can increase risk of foodborne illness. Um, and I do wanna highlight that there are many more that have not been listed. So this is a this is kind of a roadmap for what the presentation today is gonna to look like. So we're gonna talk about risk factors associated with the farm, talk about irrigation with contaminated water, uh, wildlife intrusion, contaminated soil amendments, application in the field, um, and then cross-contamination during activities like harvesting and handling um, as things that can increase risk of foodborne illness at the farm level. Then at the processing level, we're gonna talk about ineffective facility sanitation um, poor sanitary equipment design, so how easy is the equipment in a facility to clean, um, cross-contamination during washing, and then time and temperature um, abuse is a big one that's going to pop up multiple times throughout um, distribution and retail. Um, and then when we look at distribution and retail, we're looking at basically the same things. Um, ineffective sanitation applied at distribution or retail, um, also cross-contamination happening at distribution or retail. So because we have a lot of the same risk factors, um, I do want to point out that you may see some patterns in the control strategies and interventions that we talk about when addressing these challenges. 
So we're going to start with talking about uh, pre-harvest control strategies and interventions. And before we start diving into this presentation, um, I want to highlight um, the Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement, which is an organization of leafy greens producers in California and Arizona um, that publish voluntary science-based food safety metrics. Um, and these metrics are known as the LGMA metrics. Um, and they kind of provide a framework for our discussion of uh, risk management at the pre-harvest level. Um, because in a lot of cases, these metrics um, are more stringent than some of the standards required by FDA's produce safety rule um, for produce growers. So not only will I be highlighting some of these metrics throughout the discussion about pre-harvest risk factors, um, and then referencing some of the LGMA metrics about what um, benchmarks are you trying to reach for controlling those risk factors. Um, I also think that it's important to note that if you want to learn more about how to control risk at the pre-harvest level, especially for leafy greens, I would definitely read up on some of these, um, especially LGMA uh, metrics. So the first risk factor I'm going to talk about um, is wildlife intrusion. So wildlife, things like birds, uh, wild hogs, deer, um, et cetera, can, they can carry pathogens into produce fields. Um, so it's important to know your farm's common wildlife issues when thinking about this risk factor specifically because different environments can have different wildlife and those different wildlife can come with different pathogen is issues, different um, you know, seasonality issues associated with wildlife intrusion. And um, when monitoring for wildlife intrusion, so when finding out if wildlife have been in your field, um, you're going to want to do it with increased intensity right before harvest. And um, some telltale signs of wildlife intrusion, I just wanted to mention, are feces, um, so poop, uh, uh, tracks, so footprints kind of, um, of animal footprints on ground, and bite marks on crops are another good example. So control strategies and interventions to reduce the risk um, that's associated with wildlife intrusion. One of them is to scan for feces and establish a buffer distance um, around that feces in which you say, I'm not going to harvest any of the crops within this distance of the poop that I found. So LGMA has guidance um, on this. They say, um, you should be at least 1.5 meters away from fecal deposition um, before you start harvesting again. And that's a really good starting point. Um, but it's not the end all be all of what you should be doing. I wanted to point that out. Um, so you can go higher. Some research suggests that um, using a two meter no harvest buffer distance can actually decrease the chance of harvesting produce contaminated with fecal bacteria back to baseline. Um, so having this at two meters, um, and you know, those numbers you can, uh, with your own discretion, um, figure out which numbers are appropriate for your field. Some other examples of control strategies include things that can control animals themselves. So things like animal traps, think mouse traps, um, different deterrents. So, um, things like fences around, uh, forests. Um, as well as noisemakers to prevent animals from wanting to come into your field. Um, all of those things are really good control strategies to prevent wildlife from intruding into your farm. And the second risk factor we're going to talk about is livestock proximity. So when I talk about livestock, I'm referring to things like cows, poultry, and swine. Um, and they can also be major sources of pathogens. So the transmission um, pathways can be a little different. So there is, um, so basically if you have a livestock farm right here and maybe um, some of the soil from this livestock farm gets run off into this water source and you wanna use this water source um, as agricultural water, that can be a transmission pathway of livestock um, contamination to your field. And another pathway is actually just through wind. So 
sometimes on farms you'll have really dry conditions um, and then fecal material from those livestock could actually dry out and then you know wind or trucks can actually pick up that dust um, and carry it to your produce field so um, two potential pathways that can affect um, your produce based on livestock proximity are things like transmission through wind and um, dust and transmission through water. And so it's important to know where livestock are in relation to fields you might be responsible for. Um, and that's actually one of the first control strategies that we're going to be talking about is just assuring the distance of your produce field away from livestock. So LGMA guidance recommends that leafy green fields um, should be at least 1200 feet from CAFOs with over a thousand heads of cattle. So a CAFO is a concentrated animal feeding operation, um, which means that there are a lot of animals um, in this case, cattle in a confined space. So something to note here is that um, the LGMA guidance is referring to, you know, uh, livestock farms that have a lot of um, heads, but that doesn't necessarily mean that smaller farms um, of livestock are not something that you should worry about, right? So uh, risk is in black and white, basically. Um, you know, if a farm has 990 heads of cattle, that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't mean that it's not a risk because it's less than a thousand, right? So in the back of your mind, just remember that it's important to know where your farm is in relation to livestock and think about this distance that we're talking about, regardless of the size of the farm. Um, dust abatement is another control strategy um, you can use. So Things you can do to control dust from contaminating produce on your farm could include spraying down um, unpaved roads that might be close to your produce farm um, to prevent trucks that drive by from kicking up dust that can travel into your field, dust that might be contaminated with pathogens. Um, and you can also do things like preventing runoff from contaminating fields or nearby water sources um, by putting up things like vegetative buffers like you can see here. So these are trees and shrubbery that are sometimes put up around a water source uh, to reduce runoff into that water source. Um, now this intervention, and this actually goes for all the control strategies and interventions I'll be discussing, is not something you would just implement without considering how its implementation would affect other risk factors in your field. Um, so for example, with these vegetative buffers, for example, um, they may actually attract more wildlife, right? Because this provides a great habitat for more wildlife to live. So if you already have a large wildlife intrusion problem in your field, maybe putting up vegetative buffers around a water source isn't the best idea because yeah, you prevent runoff, but you increase the risk of fecal material from those wildlife ending up in that water source. So overall, um, Avoiding high risk water sources that have proximity to animals is a great strategy. Um, so another risk factor is contaminated soil amendments. Um, so soil amendments are chemical, biological, or physical materials added to soil to support plant growth and development. Um, so these are essentially fertilizers. And when you think of soil amendments, um, there's if you're talking about animal origin soil amendments, um, there's a specific name for them. And we call them biological soil amendments of animal origin. And these BSAAO can be a source of foodborne pathogens. So some examples are cattle manure, horse manure, uh, and poultry litter. So actually, um, poultry litter is not just chicken poop. It is also um, kind of a combination of chicken bedding, feathers, urine, and poop. And it kind of looks like um, this before uh, any type of processing. Um, and poultry litter makes a great fertilizer, right? It has high phosphorus and nitrogen content. But like the other manures here, um, it can potentially have high amounts of salmonella or other pathogens. And so we need to control that. And um, for control strategies and interventions, probably the first one that comes to mind is composting to reduce um, pathogens that are in those soil amendments. 
So this involves a thermal in inactivation. Um, so allowing the soil amendment to reach a certain temperature for a certain period of time, um, depending on the process that's used for composting. So here um, I have an example of the um, LGMA recommendation for enclosed compo composting. Um, and that's that the soil amendment should be at 131 degrees Fahrenheit for three days, at least. And so for this treatment, um, we want to assure that the process that we're using is validated and has been verified. So I'll be mentioning this more throughout this presentation because it applies to many produce safety interventions. Um, but what this means is that for validation, you want to know does this intervention control the risk, right? So um, you want to make sure that it's a validated process. You want to make sure that maybe there's some scientific literature to back up your use of this process. Um, and then in addition, you don't just want to make sure that the process is correct that you're using. You want to make sure that you're using the process correctly, right? So is the intervention being properly implemented? Um, so what that means is that, say, you want to make sure that your compost is reaching 131 degrees Fahrenheit for three days. Well, you need to measure that with some type of temperature um, gauge like you see here. You need to make sure that you're actually doing what you say you want to be doing. Um, and then you also need to make sure that this temperature gauge is correct, right, is calibrated to show you appropriate temperatures. So then you can truly verify that the process is being properly implemented. And so verification and validation are super important, right? Because if you, you can use any process, but if it's not, if you're not verifying that you're doing it right, and it's not a validated process, then it might, it might not have any effect, right? <clears throat> So another control strategy uh, you could use is allowing for infield die-off of biological soil amendments. So waiting some time between application of the soil amendment and harvesting of the produce to allow for die-off of the pathogens in the field. Um, and wait times can vary for different produce commodities here. So if you have produce that is going to come in contact with soil, you'll probably want to wait longer than if you have a produce commodity that is less likely to come in contact with soil. Um, for some produce commodities, this strategy is less likely to be used than others. So for example, LGMA recommends that you always use uh, composted soil amendments um, when growing leafy greens. So they recommend to basically never use um, raw BSAAO for leafy green production. So a big risk factor is contaminated agricultural water. Um, we talk about agricultural water and not irrigation water because uh, water can be used for purposes other than irrigation. Um, and ag water, as I'm going to be abbreviating it to, uh, can be used for other things as well. It can be used to dilute pesticides, um, it can be used for dust abatement, and it can also be used for frost protection. So um, there are different sources for agricultural water. Um, it can come from surface water, so water that's already in streams um, or rivers or ponds, basically visible. Um, and it can also come from groundwater, which is water that is basically underground um, and less exposed to the environment. But that same groundwater can still be pumped into ponds or reservoirs before use, so it could still be exposed to the elements. Um, there are different methods for irrigating crops. Uh, drip irrigation is the method you see on the left. Um, it involves water traveling through tubing um, and going directly into soil. So this is probably a lower risk irrigation method. Um, furrow irrigation is kind of in between. Um, it involves basically uh, flooding small canals between crops. Um, and then finally, overhead irrigation is when you basically spray irrigation water um, overhead onto crops. So this one is probably, you know, highest risk because the water um, that you're using probably is coming in contact with the most edible portion of produce. 
So a big intervention that you can use for agricultural water is you can treat it. Um, there are different types of treatments, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, I'm not going to discuss them too much here, but something important to know is that um, you should, you know, again, use validated water treatments and verify how that treatment is applied. Um, similar to soil amendments, there are some recommendations about waiting a certain amount of time between water application and harvest to allow for die off of anything um, in that water in field. Um, but this is kind of a tougher one to follow, right? And it's because you don't have as much control over um, when your crops are gonna need to be watered. So essentially you need to irrigate when you need to irrigate. And if your irrigation water just failed uh, microbiological water quality testing um, and you need to wait 14 days, you, you can't just do that and because then your crops will probably die, right? So this is a bit of a tough one to follow in general, um, but it is an option as a control strategy. So, um, when you do testing for water, um, which is often used to determine if a water source is good enough microbiological quality to be used as agricultural water, um, often the testing occurs for some sort of indicator organism, um, most specifically E. coli. So um, we're going to talk about really briefly indicator versus index organisms um, and their differences. So indicator organisms like E. coli um, their presence indicates unsanitary conditions. So things like fecal contamination. So, um, index organisms are a little bit different, right? And these basically are organisms that exist under conditions that are similar to a pathogenic organism and their presence indicates conditions where a pathogen could be found. Um, so when we're talking about index organisms, probably the only one that could be um, relevant to agricultural water um, testing would be Listeria species, which is a good index organism for Listeria monocytogenes. What isn't a good index organism is E. coli. So um, E. coli, just general generic E. coli is not an index organism for E. coli 0157H7. And it's actually not a good indicator for E. coli 0157H7 either. And the reason why is because there are probably alternative routes um, of pathogen contamination. So of having E. coli 0157H7 ending up into agricultural water, the contamination may be related to something other than sanitary conditions. So why is that important? Um, well, currently for monitoring agricultural water quality, uh, water is tested for indicators of fecal contamination, so E. coli. Um, and LGMA recommends that agricultural water with greater than this level of E. coli, 126 MPM per 100 mil, um, should not be used as agricultural water. Um, but the problem with this, as we just discussed, is that E. coli presence might not be well correlated with pathogen presence. Um, and so, yes, you may have less than 126 MPN per 100 mil of E. coli in your ag water, but that actually might not be enough to ensure that your ag water is safe to use. Um, so for example, you might still have E. coli 0157H7 in your ag water, even if you pass this test. Um, some other problems with E. coli testing in uh, agricultural water um, for monitoring the agriculture for monitoring the microbiological quality of water is that it's expensive and results are not instantaneous, um, right? So if it takes 48 hours minimum to get test results back um, in a time sensitive scenario where you need to know, can I use this water for irrigation today or not? Um, that's not really gonna fly and that can therefore be a huge problem. Because of these issues, um, what some people have been turning to is using uh, modeling to predict um, microbiological water quality. So there's some emerging evidence that the use of things like predictive models um, that use parameters such as 
meteorological, spatial, and temporal factors um, can actually be used to manage your irrigation water. Um, and they can also allow for a better assessment of risk of pathogen contamination. Um, and they can do it in real time, right? So that's kind of the, the main um, benefit to this is they could be used for a more instantaneous assessment of microbiological water quality. So another risk factor um, that we're gonna be talking about, and this is the final one for pre-harvest is cross-contamination from on-farm activities. So harvest equipment um, can harbor pathogens. So things like knives, storage containers, um, tractors and vehicles um, and worker practices as well um, can you know, spread pathogens. Um, so things like lack of good hygiene, um, you know, not having, not being able to wash your hands or not having access to proper toilet facilities um, can be a potential way that pathogens can contaminate produce um, from workers. So this is particularly important for things like viral pathogens like hepatitis A and norovirus. Um, and some control strategies and interventions for this include cleaning and sanitation of on-farm equipment. So making sure that you're cleaning and sanitizing your harvest equipment and tools um, when you're moving between commodities or between fields, um, you know, high risk to low risk areas. Um, so basically verifying consistent application of these cleaning and sanitation procedures is super important and using validated procedures for it for cleaning and sanitation is also super important. Um, and then also uh, good agricultural practices um, are also really important. So it's important to have in place worker health practice programs, uh, basically making sure that you don't have ill employees handling produce, um, making sure that you have good sick leave policies in place so employees don't show up sick to work because they need the paycheck, um, because that can very easily happen. Providing sufficient number of toilets and hand washing facilities to meet employee needs is important. Um, there is some specific guidance in good agricultural practices. Um, outlining how many toilets should be available for a certain number of employees, um, and then also how far away they should be. So when we're talking about how far away toilets should be from um, fields, you know, you don't want them to be too close, but you also don't want them to be too far away. And the biggest reason why you don't want them to be too far away is because some people um, get paid for harvesting through the amount that they're harvesting, right? So if they need to use the bathroom and the bathroom is a 25 minute hike away, um, then that's 50 minutes of produce harvesting that they are not getting paid for. And so they might be less likely to want to use an actual toilet facility um, if they need one. So that's a big reason why toilets can't be too far away either. And it's something that we need to think about. So what about testing? Um, so you might think, you know, it seems like these control strategies and interventions are a lot of time, effort, and money, and there's a lot that can't go right, right? So why can't we just test the product before harvesting and call it a day? So definitely produce testing and field is something that you can do. And usually it is done very close to harvest, uh, two to three days before. Um, the process involves people often walking around in certain patterns, um, like sampling patterns that we see here, uh, collecting um, portions of leaves, basically um, maybe collecting 60 leaves while walking in the Z pattern for a single field, then combining those 60 leaves together into one composite sample and then testing that sample for pathogens. Um, and if you don't have pathogens, then um, what does that mean, right? Does that mean that your product is safe? And the answer is not really. So a point I really wanna drive home here is testing is a verification strategy, but not a control strategy or intervention. So it can help you indicate if there was a massive contamination issue that resulted from a failure in one of your control strategies, 
Um, and so for that reason, testing is definitely important because it can be used as a verification strategy of all of those control strategies and interventions that had occurred prior. Um, so you can use it to say, hey, every single thing we did while growing um, was properly implemented um, because there's no widespread contamination in our field, right? We determined that. But in itself, testing is not a control strategy or intervention. Um, and so it can't be used to replace any of these control strategies or interventions that we discussed previously. So let's move on to post-harvest control strategies and interventions. So one potential risk factor here um, is that we have pathogens persisting in processing facilities. And this could apply to um, transport equipment and retail facilities as well, um, basically all built environments. Um, but we're going to talk specifically about processing environments with this pathogen persistence risk factor here today. So um, persistence is something that we usually apply particularly for um, the pathogen salmonella and listeria monocytogenes. Um, salmonella is more commonly persistent in dry environments, so not as applicable to produce processing environments, but some, um, so you can't necessarily rule it out. And listeria definitely is commonly found surviving and growing in cool, wet environments. Um, so therefore, listeria has actually been shown to live in processing environments for months, years, sometimes even decades. Um, and there have been some high profile uh, outbreaks and recalls uh, linked to listeria monocytogenes in processing facilities, um, particularly processing equipment. Um, so if you recall, we actually covered a case study in our last lecture um, related to a listeria monocytogenes outbreak in celery. And um, this outbreak was linked to persistent listeria in um, some processing equipment. So this is again a big issue um, because we don't have a kill step in produce packing or processing. So you need to control for these pathogens throughout all procedures um, in the processing environment basically. And so how do you do that? Um, basically probably the most effective one is validated cleaning and sanitation procedures. So when I'm talking about cleaning and sanitation procedures here, I'm not necessarily talking about the cleaning and sanitation that you do every day at the end of the shift. Um, I'm more so talking about something like a, a master sanitation plan. So these are the sanitation procedures that you do once a week, maybe once a month. Um, things like cleaning out an HVAC or the catwalk leading up to the HVAC. Um, you know, doing this is kind of a difficult task, right? You can't really do it every day because it's labor intensive and it will require a ladder to get up there. Um, but that should be something that happens periodically. And so we call that periodic infrastructure cleaning. And then we also have periodic equipment cleaning. Um, so this would be something like where you take apart equipment to better reach all internal areas. Um, that may not be as easily reached typically and taking apart this equipment it's you know it's costly it takes a lot of time um, but again this periodic cleaning is actually really essential for controlling persistent pathogens in equipment and then finally sanitary design is another one that can really um, reduce potential niches for uh, pathogens but particularly listeria um, so when we're talking about that, we're talking about how basically if you have a piece of equipment that looks like this, um, you know, there are the crevices here, places that are kind of more difficult to clean. Um, it might be a good place for food residues to basically remain and promote bacterial growth, biofilm formation. Um, and so this could be a nice niche for um, listeria persistence. And if you have, if you replace this uh, poorly designed equipment with something that's like very well designed, um, you know, this rounded surface that doesn't have any nooks or crannies or junctures, then you can likely reduce potential uh, persistence of pathogens and listeria in your facility.
So as a part of this control, you're going to need to monitor the processing environment. So typically this is done for um, listeria species, an index organism um, that we talked about earlier. It's an index organism of listeria monocytogenes, um, but it can also be done for things like foodborne pathogens and allergens as well. So again, this is a testing method. Um, and the procedures then, when you do this environmental monitoring, so basically you swab um, a bunch of different areas in your facility, you're doing this in order to verify that cleaning and sanitation procedures are consistently and correctly implemented. Um, so again, this is a really important step, but it's not necessarily the more important than the control strategy, which is the actual cleaning and sanitation. This is kind of just a verification strategy to make sure that you're doing the right thing, um, as well as doing what you say you should be doing for cleaning and sanitation. So cross-contamination during uh, produce washing is also another risk factor. Um, when you wash produce, you do it to remove things like soil, debris, plant exudates, and um, sometimes even like insect eggs, um, as well as microorganisms. And some of those microorganisms could potentially be pathogens. So during washing, those dislodged pathogens could travel through the water and cross-contaminate other produce. So a pretty obvious control strategy and intervention for this would be to add sanitizer, or sometimes they call it wash water antimicrobial, to your wash water. So um, these can be things like sodium hypochlorite, peracetic acid, chlorine dioxide, um, and basically adding antimicrobials to your wash water can prevent the transfer of pathogens from contaminated produce to uncontaminated produce. And monitoring sanitizer concentration is something that needs to be managed carefully. So um, basically organic materials, you know, things that are being removed from the produce itself during washing can actually inactivate some of these sanitizers. So monitoring the wash water to make sure you have a consistent and effective concentration is really important. Um, and you can do this through things like real-time monitoring. So you can um, have probes for things like oxidation reduction potential, pH, um, and parametric sensors that are actually detecting sanitizer levels um, through some type of sensor. And then you can look at them on a control panel. Um, and then you can also, in addition to real-time monitoring, use periodic mon monitoring. So um, using things like chlorine test strips or PAA test strips, or looking at um, using a titration or um, basically a colorimet colorimetric reaction um, can be used to monitor that your sanitizer concentration is adequate to prevent cross-contamination. So again, what about testing? <laughs> so testing is definitely something that is done for finished products. Um, and again, just broken record here, it's a verification strategy um, and it doesn't necessarily represent something that you could use to replace the control strategies and interventions that you apply previously. Um, and here, this is kind of a explanation of why it doesn't work as a control strategy. So this is a table taken from ICMSF, which is the International Committee for the Microbiological Safety of Foods. So this table right here shows you how well testing actually works at ensuring that your product is not contaminated with anything. So let's walk through this example right here. So if we say that um, in this table, we are willing to accept that our product is 2% defective. So let's say that we have a lot of lettuce and we're willing to accept that 2% of it has salmonella on it, which granted is really high. Um, basically, what this table is saying is that if we test 60 samples, so we take 60 finished product sample tests, and um, we test them for pathogens, and none of them come back as positive. Um, what this number, this 0.3 right here is representing is that um, there's actually a 30% chance with only taking 60 samples that we are not going to be able to capture the defective product that is in this lot. So 
there's a 30% chance that we're not even capturing the 2% defective product here. And so when you look at it in terms of um, the 2% defective product, that looks bad, right? But then if you think about how pathogens are typically present at even lower levels um, in a lot, then basically what we're saying is that chances of not picking up contamination issues through finished product testing might be higher than this 30%. Maybe it's even as high as like 50%. Basically sampling alone is not an effective way of saying you have a low risk product. Um, again, you can use it as a verification strategy to make sure that all your control strategies and interventions are being applied correctly. Um, basically you're avoiding something that would cause a mass contamination issue, but it's not something that can um, replace control strategies and interventions. So another risk factor is time and temperature abuse. Um, and this is one of those risk factors that pops up during processing, distribution, and at retail throughout the entire produce supply chain. So it's important um, because food that is kept at abusive temperatures can increase the chance of pathogens growing in food. Um, and high numbers of pathogens in food means more foodborne illness. So produce is particularly susceptible to pathogen growth in food because it has high water activity, um, which can support microbial growth. And again, there's no kill step prior to any type of uh, um, fresh produce storage, right? So if there are low levels that have remained throughout um, the produce supply chain, if you allow that produce to um, be stored at, abuse, at temperatures that are um, going to support microbial growth, then of course you're gonna get pathogen growth potentially. Um, so control strategies and interventions for time and temperature abuse are really focused on controlling time and temperature through things like good manufacturing practices or GMPs, uh, which make sure that temperatures are being controlled and monitored throughout processing and storage. Um, so also things like maintaining cold chain throughout um, your product leaving processing facilities and then going on to transport trucks and then um, arriving at retail establishments. Having that cold chain maintenance throughout um, and using things like data loggers throughout these steps um, to basically ensure that you are verifying to this time and temperature control um, are all really important and helpful um, for ensuring that you are not um, storing product at abusive temperatures. So final risk factor um, is cross-contamination that can occur um, at retail establishments. And this is really similar to the cross-contamination um, that occurs during work worker um, handling at farm activities, like we talked about earlier. So um, cross-contamination can happen in retail environments through worker handling, um, can happen through contaminated tools and equipment. Um, it can also happen during this procedure that we're showing here that's called uh, crisping. So um, during crisping, basically um, produce is soaked um, in some water to kind of freshen it up. And potential vehicles for this cross-contamination could be what if this uh, person in the retail establishment wasn't wearing gloves, right? That could be um, worker-mediated cross-contamination. And then also, what if this wash basin wasn't cleaned and sanitized properly? That could be uh, food contact surface-mediated cross-contamination too. So the control strategies and interventions um, we focus on are really similar to what we've talked about before again. So cleaning and sanitation of the tools and equipment is a big one. Uh, using validated cleaning and sanitation procedures and verifying their implementation is really important. Um, things like segregating specific tools. So in this case, we would talk about uh, using color coding of equipment. So making sure that you aren't using equipment that you use to butcher chicken, um, to cut fresh produce. Um, and again, improved employee training. So making sure that your employees are wearing gloves when they are um, handling fresh produce, putting it on the shelves, right? Monitoring for signs of illness, making sure that no one is sick um, and still coming to work, having good employee benefits and sick leave pay can help with that as well. 
So we've been through a ton of different control strategies and interventions and their associated risk factors, but how do you decide which control strategies and interventions need to be implemented for um, a specific portion of the produce supply chain? So I touched on this before, but it's super important that when you get to this step of establishing a food safety plan that you consider not just the one strategy that you are considering um, to implement and the risk factor that it will address, but you know all of the other risk factors in the system and how does incorporation of a new control strategy impact existing control strategies that are in place in that system. So this is important within each stage of the produce supply chain. You know, how do your vegetative buffers um, used to prevent runoff in your ag water affect the intrusion of wildlife on your farm, right? We talked about that. Um, something else that's really important is recognizing this across the different stages of the produce supply chain too. So for example, let's say that you get hired um, to be in charge of food safety and fresh produce at McDonald's. And so yes, when you are hired by McDonald's, you are going to definitely consider the food safety risks that happen in retail establishments, right? You're gonna consider those things like worker handling, um, spreading of uh, communicable diseases, especially things like Hep A and um, norovirus, but you can't just look at those, right? Um, because you also have to think about where your product has been. You have to think about was the processing facility, um, were they using effective cleaning and sanitation procedures? Um, because if not, maybe product could have picked up listeria contamination from there. You also have to think about, you know, maybe even going all the way back to was the farm or ranch the product was grown at using a treatment to control um, the microbiological quality of their irrigation water? Um, was it a validated treatment? Was the treatment process verified? Because all of those practices are where the produce that is now in your hands has been. So you need to take all of those into consideration when deciding what control strategies and interventions you should be incorporating. Um, and this is this practice is basically what we call like risk management. So how are you gonna manage all of your risks? Um, and so now we're gonna do an exercise related to what risk management might look like in a real world scenario um, of an employee on a small farm. So to do this, I'm joined here by my colleagues, uh, Claire Murphy and Luke Chang, and we're going to be role playing here. So both Luke and Claire are going to be playing the role of young food safety professionals um, who are basically just hired to manage the food safety on this farm. This role previously didn't exist, um, but basically this farm, this smaller farm wants to sell some of their product to a larger grocery store chain now, and that large grocery store re requires them to have a clearly defined uh, food safety plan in place. So I will be playing the farm manager, um, and I'm going to be asking um, of Luke and Claire as the new hired food safety professionals to come up with a food safety plan. And the one thing I ask is to develop a food safety plan that can keep our product safe. So that's not so hard, right? Uh, so a little, some quick facts about the farm. The farm is not covered by the FDA's produce food safety rule. And that's because um, currently the farm makes less than $25,000 um, in produce sales annually. So before we get started, I'm just going to orient you to um, this map right here. So this is our farm. We have a road right here and a road right here. Um, so these are all of our fields. Basically, every single field that you see here belongs to our small farm. Um, there is a stream right here and um, this stream is used, we grab surface water from this stream um, as our irrigation water at points right here. Um, so these fields get irrigated from water that comes out of this point, and these fields get irrigated from water that comes out of this point of the stream. 
Um, the stream actually flows to the left of the screen. So it flows um, from right to left. And um, as you travel down the stream, you see a dairy farm. So this is a dairy farm that has um, about 300, 400 cows. Um, and basically the dairy farm is close to the irrigation water source, but um, we grab water from upstream of where the dairy farm is. Um, so essentially, now that we've kind of oriented ourselves about uh, everything in this farm, um, locations and stuff, let's now focus on what are you going to do? What is your first step um, as a new hiree to keep this produce safe? Absolutely. So I would start by just asking some questions about their farm operation. You know, do they test their water? What does their water quality look like? Uh, what is their biggest concern? Uh, and so I can start targeting my food safety plan based on uh, the information that they currently have and what they believe to be really their highest risk. Okay, so um, no, we have not tested our water um, at all. We didn't really um, have a need to in the past. We are a small grower. So um, we don't test our water. What else? Uh, in addition to asking questions, I would uh, observe the farm by myself, like to observe how employees are handling tools, how often do they sanitize the tools, and how knowledgeable are they about GAPs? Um, and also like how they execute, if they use soil amendment, how they execute this step. These observations are, so the farmer might not uh, reveal this information for you that you have to look for yourself, I guess. So you're asking, um the right questions, you're going about this the right way. Um, you know, you are going to want to do kind of a systematic go through of each of those um, risk factors that we talked about, right? You're not going, you're, you're gonna say, what's your ag agricultural water like? Um, what's your procedure for soil amendments? Um, do you have verifiable and validated cleaning and sanitation procedures for your harvest equipment? But Think about it um, as in, so what would be the first step that you would do though? Cause you just got hired um, and you know, product may be shipping out tomorrow. So what would be something that you would wanna do your first day? Do a round of testing? I don't know. So. <laughs> So you want to do testing, um, but how long does testing take to get results for? Usually like a minimum of 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours. So I think what I would do is going back to like Luke, what Luke said, I would, you know, walk around and, you know, identify what I think might be the highest risk things. Uh, you know, I don't know how much I can accomplish that first day if, if there is an issue, but starting to identify what issues need to be addressed, like are my priority as this new food safety person on this farm. Um, right, so what are our, so, so figuring out which areas to specially target first, right? Because you don't have a lot of time, this is your first day, so what are the high risk areas? The other thing that I would ask is, what produce is closest to harvest? Because the closest produce to harvest is the highest risk. So which fields are about to be harvested, right? So if it's, um, if say this field right here is um, ready to go out, super close to harvest, but you don't have any idea about their irrigation water testing, then, that would be something that you might um, 
you know, do some extensive produce testing on because that's all you'd have. You don't have any background about the um, control strategies and interventions that they've been implementing because up until now, they really haven't done much. Um, something that I didn't mention is that they are using drip irrigation um, as opposed to overhead spray. So there is a bit less risk associated with that. Um, but we still need to basically prioritize high risk areas, um, find out what the harvest dates are, then review standard operating procedures um, for harvest. And then you would go down and focus on that list that you were talking about. So let's talk about wildlife. Let's talk about irrigation water. Let's talk about um, soil amendments and let's talk about sanitation and cleaning. Um, so which fields would you designate as high risk? I think each one has different risks of different uh, risk factors. So the one that we pointed to, to maybe being that first one to be harvested that has a really high risk of animal intrusion uh, compared to some of the other fields. Uh, and so I think each field has its own risk of different uh, factors depending on you know the, the product, how it's being treated, where it is located. So what would be a control strategy or intervention that you think you could apply um, to mitigate wildlife intrusion um, at this field? It could be fences with yeah, like maybe something noise like maker. Right, maybe something like a fence. This might not be something that you could do tomorrow, right? Again, we, we had to prioritize uh, talking about harvest and how we're gonna harvest things. But yeah, so basically within six months, you're going to want to um, you know, explore the water profiles, right? Because before you know how to treat, um, you know what method you should use to treat irrigation water if you even need to treat irrigation water. You need to know things like the uh, microbial levels in that water to begin with. So like the E. coli levels in that water, you need to know, uh, you know, um, the organic material that's in that water, things like that. Um, and then, right, we would come up with protocols for uh, checking for wildlife intrusion. So how often are you going to check for wildlife intrusion and what deterrents are you going to use? So a, um, a fence would probably be a really good one. And um, we're also, so then we get to this point where we're like, what are we going to do within six months? What should our goals be? Um, so let's say that we come up with goals of, um, so after six months, we're going to have water treatment in place for all of our irrigation water. We're also gonna have wildlife deterrence in place after six months, so fences. And we'll have new SOPs for cleaning and sanitation because those didn't really exist prior. Um, does this strike you as a high risk, medium risk, or low risk facility? And should we even be growing produce here? I would not say it's a high risk facility. I think there's definitely things that could put it at more of a risk. Uh, and I think that there's always ways to reduce our risk. And so I would say that there's no need to stop growing produce at this facility. We just need to evaluate uh, and come up with a plan to reduce the risk that currently exists. Yeah. I would add on to that. I think some fields are more risky than others. So like the fields on the interior, I definitely don't think they are as high risk as others, as, as exterior ones. So there's seem to be no reason to stop the harvesting of those. Right. Exactly. So we have we have some low risk fields here. So yeah, we should be watching our high risk fields. Um, maybe we could also think of 
planting different crops that are lower risk in the high risk fields. So, um, you know, maybe not planting the leafy greens in this one or this one or the one closest to the dairy farm. Um, but definitely in these low risk fields, that might be more of an option. Um, what about, so do you think that because, do you think that it's worth it to grow produce um, here? Oh, I think it needs some sort of cost benefit analysis, but like if you, if you're applying to many intervention strategies, then it, it not might be economically feasible. I think it's hard to decide without calculating the numbers. That's definitely a great point. We should definitely make sure that our uh, costs for all of these food safety uh, measures are not outweighing the profit that we make from growing produce. So that's actually a great point, Luke. Um, so in terms of saying we still grow produce in the field though, um, we're saying that it's probably a good idea, right? Even though there are risks, there may be greater risks somewhere else. And um, actually I did want to share the larger uh, shootout of this aerial image because say you, you wanna move your farm somewhere else because you're not as big of a fan of, um, you know, the wildlife intrusion issues, the proximity to dream and forest, um, also the proximity to the dairy farm, but say you move your entire produce farm to maybe here, um, but this area may be even worse, right? Because you don't have these lower risk areas in a field like this. Maybe this area, this field is mostly just surrounded by forests. You have way more wildlife intrusion potential. Um, you're also close to a neighborhood. Um, so it's not really, there's going to be risk associated with every location and it's just about how you manage them. That's kind of more important. Um, and also I did wanna point out that I don't want you to think that I'm um, ragging on this farm because I'm, so why am I ragging on this farm basically? Um, it's because it's a Cornell research farm. So this is not a commercial operation. We would not, uh, you know, critique kind of so critically um, a commercial farm operation the way that we did here, but this is the Cornell Research Farm um, and its purpose is this, right? This is how we learn um, through critique and evaluation of uh, different things like this. So hopefully this gave you some idea of some of the complexities of the produce supply chain and how to manage risks. Um, we have a, another course um, in our modeling module that's called uh, Introduction to Risk Analysis and Microbial Risk Assessment. Um, so if you wanna find out more about how to make better decisions for implementing control strategies and interventions to improve food safety, um, you can check that out. And then finally, back to our take home messages. Um, hopefully through this, you learned a little bit more about how some of the food safety challenges in the produce supply chain are distinctly unique. Um, we really hope that we made it clear that preventative approaches are um, definitely more effective than reactive approaches like testing. Testing is not a control strategy to reduce food safety risk. Um, it's a verification strategy and you need to incorporate preventative approaches. It's not a substitute. Um, we hope that we gave you some insight into how potential risk factors uh, need to be considered together, as well as um, how you need to look at the produce supply chain as an interconnected whole system when choosing to make decisions targeted at reducing risk. And that's because, of course, um, 
there's no way to achieve zero risk. So thank you, Luke and Claire. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation.